Thank you. Welcome back. Um, we will now proceed uh, with the vote on Ebola vaccine, and I will ask each voting member to please state whether they have a conflict of interest or not prior to the vote. Um, and then uh, at the end, if you wish to explain your vote, you may do so. So with that having been said, um, we will start with Dr. Lee and move to her right. So, Lee, no conflicts, yes. Sanchez, no conflict, yes. Alt, no conflicts, yes. Bata, no conflicts, yes. Talbot, no conflicts, yes. Atmar, no conflicts, yes. Salaji, no conflicts, yes. Bernstein, no conflicts, yes. Paling, no conflicts, yes. McNally, no conflicts, yes. Hunter, no conflicts, yes. Bell, no conflicts, yes. Fry, no conflicts, yes. Romero, no conflicts, yes. So the motion carries uh, carries unanimously uh, to pass all three now as combined vote um, uh, language uh, statements. Um, does anyone wish to explain their vote or add additional comment? Please, Dr. Ald. I, I just wanted to get into the public record what we talked about briefly at lunch. Um, we had some task force 10 and 15 years ago to talk about language around vaccination and pregnancy kind of as a lead up to the Tdap and the pandemic that was going on at the same time and you, you know I think what we decided a few there are only a few of us here that were on those task force I think what we decided was that we were going to state the data that we had basically and and uh, you know tell people what we know and what we don't know and I think that'll apply to this vaccine as well Thank you. Any other comments? Anything else to enter into the record? All right. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent work on, on the work group for having done that. Um, so uh, now we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, we are very lucky to have Dr. Messonnier here to talk about the 2019 novel coronavirus, um, uh, COVID-19, uh, um, and she's going to give us the informational session. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. It's uh, a little weird to be on this side of the podium. Um, there are more than 800 people at CDC working on this um, response, and I'm certainly pleased to be able to um, be the person they could spare for a little while to tell you a little bit about what's going on um, and answer a few questions. Coronaviruses are a large family of viruses that cause respiratory illness, their name for these crown-like spikes on the surface. And um, in general, coronaviruses are a zoonotic disease that is they're generally spread among animals and can sometimes jump to people. There are seven human coronaviruses. The more common coronaviruses are associated with disease spectrum, like the common cold. And then there are these three other coronaviruses, SARS and MERS, which you're familiar with, and then the new coronavirus, which was named, I did not name this, SARS-CoV-2, which causes the disease COVID-19. So the more common human coronaviruses usually cause mild to moderate upper respiratory tract infections, but they can cause more severe disease like pneumonia and bronchitis. The symptoms are the symptoms you'd expect of a viral upper respiratory infection. And lab tests can be used to diagnose these common coronaviruses, but generally folks don't test and so they don't identify it. Common human coronaviruses spread from an infected person to others through respiratory droplets, close contact, through fomites. They commonly occur in fall and winter, but they can occur year round. Young children are most likely to get infected. And in general, most people will get infected at least once in their lifetime. I provided that maybe as just a backdrop to compare to what's going on with COVID-19. So um, COVID-19 was identified in Wuhan, China in, in December 2019. And really amazingly, within a rapid period of time, within two weeks, was identified as being caused by a novel coronavirus, again, named SARS-CoV-2. 
Early on in the first identification of this outbreak in December, many of the patients were reported to have a link to a large seafood and live animal market. But as more data subsequently became available, it became clear that may, many patients did actually not have an exposure to animal markets. And that is both the cases that occurred before the big cluster at the market and certainly the cases after, indicating person-to-person -person spread. Um, Travel-related exportation of cases was quickly reported, and the first U.S. case was identified on January 20th. We are reporting COVID-19 cases online, and um, I'll just keep directing you back to this website. We update our numbers every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, the global spread of COVID-19 is actually pretty remarkable. There have so far been 80,000 cases of COVID-19 confirmed. Um, this is a map that John Hopkins um, publishes online. It's actually really helpful to be able to put this to scale. And you can certainly see the many countries that have dots, but the majority of cases remain in China and especially in Hubei province. There have been so far 2,708 deaths reported from COVID-19. In terms of the U.S., um, there are 14 COVID-19 cases in the United States. 12 of those are travel-related, that is, individuals who had direct travel themselves to the affected areas in Hubei, and then two that had person-to-person -person spread, that is, um, they were close contacts of cases. So the total number of cases confirmed in the U.S. remains at 14, with um, 445 taste patients, patients tested. We separate out the second table below, which is patients, um, cases among persons repatriated to the United States. And so after the closure of Hubei province, a large number of people were, um, were repatriated to the United States aboard several um, uh, airplanes. And there are three patients with novel coronavirus associated with those um, repatriations from Hubei. In addition, after the outbreak identified in the Diamond Princess cruise ship in Japan, a large number of people were repatriated from that ship. And that has led to 42 cases among Americans in the United States um, repatriated from that cruise ship. Now, there are addition, additional Americans in Japan who um, had an exposure associated with that cruise ship, and there are additional patients, Americans in Wuhan, who also um, were associated with, again, exposure in Wuhan. But these are the cases in the United States. Certainly, a, a major topic of consideration is how it's spread, and investigations are ongoing, but here's what we think now. And it's largely based on what is known from other coronavirus, as well as the epidemiological data that we're gathering from this. But in general, the presumption is still that it's primarily through close person-to-person -person contact with respiratory droplets. But there is some data that suggests that at least some minority of cases are exposed by touching a surface or object that has the virus on it, and then touching the mouth, nose, or eyes. Um, the data available suggests that the early symptoms of COVID-19 are, again, as you'd expect from other viral respiratory diseases, fever, cough, and shortness of breath. But there is a wide range of illness severity that's been reported, mild to severe disease, and certainly, as you've seen from the numbers, this can result in death. Um, estimated incubation period, we still believe, is 2 to 14 days. I think in the rush to make sure that everybody around the world knows information as quickly as possible, there have been some unpublished reports in the lay literature suggesting longer incubation periods, but the published literature still, still focuses on 2 to 14 days. Complications can um, include pneumonia, respiratory failure, multi-system organ failure, and certainly the deaths that we have been reported are more common in people with underlying illnesses on and on the older age spectrum. Um, in terms of prevention and treatment, I'll start by saying that there is no specific antiviral treatment licensed for COVID-19. There are a variety of products that are licensed for other reasons that are being investigated for the potential role in um, COVID-19. 
In general, we recommend the same everyday preventative actions that you would use for any respiratory diseases. Washing your hands, avoiding touching your eyes, nose, and mouth, avoiding contact with people who are sick, staying home when you're sick, covering your cough, disinfecting objects. But because there is no specific antiviral treatment, so, um, the general treatment for patients has been supportive care to relieve symptoms and manage pneumonia and respiratory failure. I'm happy to report that in general, the cases in the United States as of this morning are doing well, have been doing well, and are on the less severe end of the spectrum, although several have required oxygen. But the cases as of this morning um, were actually primarily um, recovering. We have a lot of information online available about COVID-19, and I would again direct you to our website. Um, it is the place where we try every day to make sure that our information is as up-to-date as possible, that our guidances and communication materials are as up-to-date as possible. So when you want to know something, the definite first place I would send you is to the website. And We've tried to put information on here that is helpful to every sector of the um, community, public-facing materials, materials for healthcare providers, and certainly materials for public health. Um, so www.cdc.gov slash COVID-19. Um, CDC's Traveler's Health Notice are sort of listed separately. Most people know where to find that. Um, and we are recommending seeking medical care if you feel sick with fever, cough, and difficulty breathing, and have a travel history that is um, consistent with COVID-19. And I, I, I say this to say this is the current definition. It's actually useful to know that of the 12 patients in the U.S. that had travel-associated COVID-19, um, multiple of those returned to the U.S. and were asymptomatic when they returned, but they received information somewhere along their route that told them this exact information. If you get these symptoms and you have this travel history, please contact your healthcare provider. And they did, and they were diagnosed, and they were diagnosed with the minimal of exposure to other people. As the disease continues to spread globally, we are certainly looking at these case definitions. And um, this is definitely an outbreak that day by day, sometimes many times a day, um, there's new information that we're synthesizing and incorporating it into the recommendations. What CDC is doing. I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a, um, a ride through what we're doing, and I am sure I'm going to miss something important. Certainly, a big part of our early strategy is travel recommendations. Um, we recognize that any border control strategies are not absolute, and the reason for these strategies were to try to slow entry of this disease into the United States, knowing that we certainly can't seal off our borders. Um, there was a presidential proclamation suspending entry of foreign nationals who visited China within the past 14 days, exempting immediate family members, U.S. citizens, legal permanent residents. Um, we are doing enhanced entry screening of anyone coming in from China. And we do have a, a variety of travel alerts, the most important, I think, being the level three travel alerts to China and South Korea, which says to avoid non-essential travel. Um, you'll see the level two and level ones up there. State and local readiness is a key part of any strategy in terms of preparedness and response, as it is for everything that we do. Um, our states, um, we're dependent on them for their active monitoring of health of travelers from China. It's also really important that the states and local health departments are pivoting to um, assess state and local readiness to implement community mitigation measures if they, these come necessary. And they're working to identify and mitigate gaps in readiness to reduce disease spread while protecting workers, infrastructure, and institutions, linking public health agency and the healthcare systems to identify and mitigate stressors to health systems. And honestly, if even if we weren't in a COVID-19 outbreak, these would still be the things that a local and state health department is already doing. Everything that we're doing with the states is built on um, eons of preparedness and work that has been going on in the states as well as at CDC. Um, engagement with the uh, um, public health and healthcare sector is important. This is by weekly calls with um, core public health partners, NATO, CST, APHL, and ASTO. But I actually, um, I, I guess, and add, um, yeah, I, I think that actually those were probably everyday calls. At least every day there is some call with one of these organizations, and we have multiple subsets of these organizations that we're talking with. We have bi weekly private sector calls. 
And we're doing a lot of um, outreach with the whole of government, with attorney generals, mayors, and governors, all of whom have a stake in this. And certainly multiple conversations with public health associations, webinars, podcasts, um, conference calls. I think we've broken every record for the number of people that are participating in our um, COCA calls, our clinician calls. Um, a major part of any strategy to control a disease like this is preparing first responders, healthcare providers, and healthcare systems. And this is a whole of government effort to establish plans to understand healthcare uses and potential surgeons, developing guidance on infection control, preparedness assessments, PPE supply planning, clinical evaluations, and management. Again, a lot of this information is on our website. Reinforcing infection control principles. I know you agree, as I do, a the importance of making sure that our healthcare practitioners who are treating these patients are kept safe. Leveraging existing telehealth tools, if those are things that we're going to need to use, and certainly engaging supply chain partners to understand supply usage and needs. If this disease continues to spread globally, um, it is possible that we will see community spread in the United States. And I think that as the outbreak has surged in the past week, among the public health, we've become increasingly concerned that at some point in the future, we may see community spread. We don't know when, but it certainly is, we shouldn't be surprised with the respiratory viral disease spreading like this, that there might be community spread. And what we're asking of folks in this community and family readiness space is to start preparing for that. We're not asking folks to implement changes, but we're asking them to be prepared so that if these changes need to be implemented, we've already had the conversations. We're developing business guidance for public and private sector adaptations like telework and flexible sick leave policies. And again, these are the same kind of things that we worked on in the last pandemic of influenza. We have a head start in doing some of this. We're publishing guidance for child care programs, K through 12 schools, colleges, and universities. In case, for example, at some level, schools need to be on hiatus, that's a possibility. Other countries have done. We want schools and systems to have thought in advance how they might be able to implement that and for families to have thought about it. We're providing planning guides for use by families, communities, and faith-based organizations, as well as event planners for mass gatherings. And we certainly believe it's important to be educating communities about these non-pharmaceutical interventions, which is the broad category that we use for this space. Oh, I guess I should also say, since I'm an ACIP, that you know work has already begun on vaccines, and um, it is on the most fastest possible path. There are multiple vaccine candidates in the United States as well as globally, um, including one that NIH is working on, and. But even as fast as that could possibly work, the timeline for that is 12 months, optimistically. And so um, it makes it even more important to think through these non-pharmaceutical interventions, because if there is indeed broader spread in the United States and we need to implement interventions, social distancing is one of those tools in our toolkit that we may be relying on. And that's why we really have been pushing folks to think in advance about these NPIs. I am going to stop there. I could go on for a long time, but um, I'll stop there. And Jose, I'm happy to answer a couple questions. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Messini. Dr. Schaffner. Nancy, uh, first of all, I think I probably speak for everyone in this room. Thank you for all you're doing and the leadership you're providing. We appreciate it enormously. Now, if I may sneak in a question, <laughs> um, perhaps you could uh, address testing. I know uh, in the infectious disease community, there's a desire to assist in the diagnosis 
and of, of cases as early as possible, and they would love to start testing a bit more frequently than they're able to now. Perhaps you could give us a, a, a word or two about that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we should celebrate the successes and admit the places where things haven't gone as smoothly as we'd like. Um, the, um, our partners in China posted the sequences of this strain within really two weeks of um, at least public announcement of the outbreak, and that's remarkable. CDC scientists were able to rapidly take that genetic sequencing data and turn it into diagnostics that were rapidly available in the U.S. in an incredibly short timeline under the FDA's EUA, um, which meant that we were able to start testing, and that um, first identified case in the U.S. was identified with that um, uh, our RT-PCR kit. Um, our desire has certainly been to as quickly as possible get it out to our state and local partners, but in doing that and doing the quality control that you would expect of us to make sure that the test was as perfect as possible, some of the state and local health departments ran into problems in terms of assuring quality control. Right now, there are only 12 state and local health departments that are using the test. We are moving as quickly as we can in very close partnership with FDA to get it out to the rest of the public health labs in the US. But really, to do what you're asking and what we all want, commercial availability of these kits is key. That is, it really is commercial availability that would provide the tool to a clinician who needs to test. And certainly, that's all of our goal. We are, again, working really closely with FDA to get that moving forward. And that's why right after we grew the virus, because we did have to grow it first, we put it at the NIH's BEI repository resource, um, which you have to ask Barbara if somebody wants to know what that stands for. But we put the virus there on purpose because we really want to facilitate commercial companies taking the diagnostics and turning it into something that's commercially available. And I think that is moving as, as quickly as we as a community can make it move. Of course, it's never going to be fast enough, but I mean, that is our intention. Dr. Weber, please. Uh, thank you, uh, and we do appreciate all your efforts. I just want to ask you two questions, or two things I think CDC can help with. One is the testing, and we have one of the world's uh, experts in coronaviruses at UNC, Dr. Ralph Barrick. We've already developed our own test, which is sensitive and specific, and approved uh, uh, with our county health director and our state uh, epidemiologist and the health department. We had planned to begin testing, using it as a research test, and sending parallel tests to the CDC. This would, of course, allow us to treat a person as a suspect case and uh, uh, protect our healthcare personnel as well as the community pending the CDC test. But our lab directors, based on the recent FDA communication, feel that they are unable to use that test. While we did develop our own test for SARS, MERS, and novel, eight, novel uh, 2009 flu, and those all worked. So we would hope that you would get this FDA to allow us at least to begin using that test as a research basis until CDC pushes their tests out to the health departments until a commercial test is available. The second issue that would help us in preparedness, as we know, of course, there is a government stockpile for many different items. We don't know what's in it. Uh, and as you know, for N95 respirators, we need to train people per OSHA. And similarly, if there are ventilators that we need to use, we need to have trained respiratory therapist, realizing you may not want to release all the numbers about where they're stored and how much, it would at least help if we knew what was stored so we could be prepared so if we needed that equipment, our people would be trained as opposed to sitting and trying to read manuals the day it arrives. So both of those things would help in our uh, preparedness for large numbers of patients. Thank so you. To the first question, I would say that it is FDA that has oversight over the diagnostic tests, and I am not sure whether our FDA liaison, who I think comes from the vaccine side, um, feels equipped to speak to that. I wish I were equipped, but it, it's, <laughs> it's a different center entirely. Sorry. But, but what I would say is that, you know, it's well heard, and um, again, our FDA colleagues are at lockstep with us in trying to resolve this problem. Um, in terms of the second question, I, I would say to start with that, as, as most of you know, the stockpile is also not a CDC resource. It belongs to the ASPR, um, and so I can't speak directly to that question. But what I would say is that this issue is a major focus of our preparedness activities. Um, 
the importance of PPE to protect the healthcare sector, vitally important to us. We do have guidance on the website that really focuses on the use side. So um, if we have models, which we do, of a long, prolonged outbreak, there is, a, um, there is the potential to have supply issues. And it really depends on how long that outbreak lasts and how, what the severity is, of it is. But we are asking the healthcare sector now to use our guidance to think through how they might be sparing of those resources in the eventuality that we might need it later. And so I'm happy to talk in more specific. I think that we're plugged in with Shea in, the, in those efforts, but it is something that we're asking everyone in the healthcare sector to think about because it may be a precious resource and we'd want to make sure that, you know, that we're using it cautiously now. We want to make sure folks are protected, but if there are ways to conserve it, now is the time to start thinking about it. Dr. Maldonado. Thank you, Nancy. And again, I, I want to echo the sentiments. I think that you've done a really amazing job in a very short time of keeping us informed. Um, I want to echo the sentiments around the lab test. We also have a PCR that looks pretty sensitive and specific and are just waiting to be able to use it. And the reason that's important is leads to my second question, which is, Right now, we are doing well, even in California, where we have a number of people coming in from the Pacific Rim area. But um, if we do think that there are going to be other places that may uh, we may need to think about uh, screening, uh, we may wind up with a surge um, in the hospital, which we can handle. But as we remember with uh, H1N1 that during the novel year of 2009, um, it would be difficult to cohort patients together if you don't really know how to separate them, and then you might wind up with more transmission. So that's a real urgent issue for us is to know, is, you know, generally we would cohort respiratory patients together, but this is one where we feel that that would, might be difficult. And then the second, uh, so that's more of a comment. The second question, the real, the real question I have is, given that we have level two now for Italy, et cetera, some of us at universities, students are coming back, and now people are asking, should we be treating them with self-isolation? We're doing that for healthcare workers, for example, from South Korea, or who have come back from South Korea. But the question is, for level two, do you think that is recommended, or do you feel that there will be updates coming soon about what's going to happen in Europe? Um. Yeah. So let me just say, I, I, maybe I should have said this in the beginning, and I, I think you all know this, but this is really proceeding in real time, right? I mean, it really has only been two months, and we don't have enough of a track record of this pathogen. So everything we're learning um, is in some ways new based on what we've learned from other viruses, sure, but everything we're learning, um, we have to consider and synthesize and try to see how it impacts our response. Um, Right now, we're not recommending that Italy travelers be treated that way because it doesn't show widespread transmission. But in fact, with CST, and Chris, I don't know if you want to say anything, we're struggling together around this question of what the PUI definition is. Do you want to? Sure. And I, I do apologize. I actually stepped out earlier to listened to the conversation just about an hour ago. So it's really, really changing very fast. And one of the discussions was, as more and more countries get added into these higher levels, which is changing daily, as, Nan as Dr. Messonnier said, um, w there's no way public health can track everybody coming back from Europe, for example. So it's going to get untenable at a certain point to track travelers. And there's probably, uh, as we all work together, I think what we're going to uh, do is probably make a plan to um, have a lower level for these other countries as they come on board, because public health can simply not maintain and track. And, and as we move into the phase two of our response and realize we can't keep it out, um, those conversations are very robust and going on literally today. So hopefully in a day or two, you'll see some reflections on some of the CDC website about some of the decisions that are being made. I guess I also just want to take the moment to say that I, I appreciate your all support and appreciate the support of this community. Um, many of you have been planning for a pandemic for your whole careers, um, and that planning is exactly what we're depending on here. But equally, we're depending on all the sectors of the healthcare community that we've all built relationships with and worked on for 
many years. I mean, this is a setting in which it's going to take the entire village to be able to respond. We need to prepare for something serious. Of course, we're all going to hope that that's not what comes to pass. But it really is the community of all of you that are going to um, going to get us ready. Hank has something. I have to Dr. Bernstein. So, so I, I just wanted to say that you're, you really are spearheading a, a truly impressive effort by the uh, CDC in such an amazingly short uh, time frame. The knowledge and experiences from past pandemics seem to uh, helping guide emergency readiness preparation. And it's making a huge difference in informing and educating the public here in the United States and uh, around the world. So thank you and of course the hundreds of uh, CDC personnel for their ongoing job well done and uh, I think we've only just begun. There's a lot more that will unfold as time goes on. So let me also close by saying that I happen to be the most visible face at the moment, but as you imagine, the entire leadership of the agency is at the table working on this. Our incident manager is Dr. Dan Jernigan. Many of you know him as the flu czar. And we are drawing on the entire expertise of the agency. So this is not a one-man show. This is really at CDC pulling everybody in to make this work together. Thank you. I, I know there are a lot of questions. I'm sorry. We, we have to move forward. And, and Dr. Messonnier has other commitments. Um, so I, I think that that's it. Thank you very much. I'm sorry.